I thought we'd have a little look at a neat little algorithm that actually is super, super popular, and that's iterative closest point. So the ICP algorithm is used all the time to align point clouds either in two dimensions, three dimensions, or maybe even more, right, depending on what you're doing. So for example, if you're using a robot and you're examining a scene and you've got LiDAR, you're gonna be finding lots and lots of data points saying this is a surface over here and it's this far away. And the question is if you're driving along and you're capturing this LiDAR repeatedly, you've gotta try and put all these point clouds together into a bigger one that represents your whole, the whole space that you're in. And the question is how do we actually align lots of sets of points like this? So I've done a slightly smaller scale version here, right? You've got to imagine this is millions and millions of points repeatedly at, I don't know, multiple times a second from some expensive laser scanner. Now I have, don't have an expensive laser scanner, nor is this 3D, but it, the exact same principles apply. Iterative closest point is also used for things like image stitching and can be used for lots of different things. So, you know, it's very, very common. Essentially, this is the problem, right? So what we've done, we've let, I mean, I've drawn some points on here, right? These are in two dimensions, and I'm just gonna copy these points over here to pretend that what I've done is captured a second sample of these points at some later time. But between those two times, maybe I've moved or the camera's moved or the object has moved. And so maybe my points are sitting over here or something like this, right? Now I'm using this kind of baking paper as my best effort of obtaining some sort of tracing paper. Is this your um, audition for number file with that? That's, yeah, yeah, I mean, we'll see how it goes, right? It's, it's, it's partially, partially see-through, that was what I went with. Um, I considered making my own tracing paper, but it looked really messy. This is our sort of reference cloud. So this is some amount of points that we scanned ahead of time. Let's say in the previous LiDAR scan or earlier when we did a laser scan of an object, right? It's quite common, for example, in films, you know, you might build a mask in, or an object you want to, to animate in three dimensions using like clay, using an artist or something like this, and then maybe you laser scan this to get a nice mesh. Right? It's, it's the idea. So anyway, you've got some points, and we've now captured some other points over, that are sitting over here, right? Now, these look like the same points, but, and, and to me, it's pretty obvious you just go like this, right? But humans are quite good, good, good at this problem. Um, we're good at pattern recognition. The question is, if you're a computer, how do you do this? How do you work out what the correct rotation and the correct translation is so that you can intersect these points as close as possible? Some points might be missing, there might be too many points, things like this. And the other issue you've got is you have to do it really, really quickly, right? Because if you do a brute force search of all the possible rotations and all the possible translations, you will eventually stumble upon this, but it could take you hundreds of thousands of years. So that, that isn't gonna help you when you're trying to reconstruct your LiDAR scan, you know, in real time as you drive through a scene or something like this. So what are we gonna do? Well, let's, what's the problem we're trying to solve? For each of these points, we want to find the point that sits on this cloud, right, which we don't know, and then we wanna minimize the distance from that point. So for example, if we had a pair between this point and this point, then quite simply we want to minimize the Euclidean distance between these two, so Pythagoras essentially, so it's gonna do that, right? And for one point, that's not so difficult. Right? Even for two points, you can kind of just sort of, you can just sort of do that. The problem is that in this situation, we don't have this correspondence. We don't know that this point goes with this point and this point goes with this point, right? I only know them because I just drew them out and there's not very many points, right? For millions of points, I'm gonna to struggle too. <laughs> so the question is, what do we do? Iterative closest point, the, the word iterative means, you know, we iterate this number of times. The idea is that we first try and find the best possible combination of matches or correspondences between these points. And then given those correspondences, we try and optimize the translation and the rotation, and that will be okay. And then we will repeat that process and we'll try it again. Right, that's the idea. So let's have a go. I just literally drew these at random. So I have no idea if this is a good example or not, but we'll, we will try it. Let's imagine that this is where my points are. Now, of course, if I move this around, this is all gonna go wrong. So the closest point to this one is, is this, and the closest point to this is probably also this, and maybe this. In fact, quite a lot of them connect to this point, which is not ideal. Let's just, for the sake of being a little bit more interesting, say that these two connect over here, right? So something like that. What we do now is, is that we ignore all these points, because these points, essentially what we're saying in this iteration is that they're not anything to do with this mesh. Maybe this has got a million points, and we've only taken a small extra scan. We're just adding in some more points. So. What we can now do is calculate the center of mass of these two points, which is here, and the center of mass of these points, which is here, and we can put them in the same place, right? And then we can rotate this so that the distances of each of these points to the originals 
is minimized. So these ones, remember, go to this one. So we can try and sort of rotate it so that it's sort of there, right? Something like this. And that's our first iteration. Now, it's clear to me, having done this, that my drawing lines on doesn't make any sense because now I can't move the lines. We're going to have to pretend the lines are gone. Can um, you wipe them off? Will it wipe off that paper? I don't know. No, it's a Sharpie. No, oh, no, no. It's fine, it's fine. Um, yeah, we, 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 people can see what I'm doing, right? So let's, and then what we're going to do is we're going to iterate this process. So we're going to do the correspondence problem again. So actually, this one now goes to here. This one goes to here. Uh, let's say there, 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 and there. And then what we do is we repeat this process. So we can say, okay, so given the center of mass of these points that we've matched to and our new points, we can kind of move it over here. And then maybe we adjust the rotation a little bit as well. And then we reassign some points and we move it over here and we adjust the rotation and we reassign and we repeat this process for some number of iterations that slowly moves these points towards one another. Right, that's the idea. So it's actually a super straightforward algorithm. And eventually what hopefully happens is you kind of get the right correspondences and once you've got the right correspondences, your translation and your rotation should solve it to put these exactly where they're supposed to be. There's a few caveats here, right? I've gone from here all the way over to here. That is not guaranteed with iterative cosis point because if your correspondences are completely bogus, then your movement is going to be super bogus and you're just not going to find anything good. You know, maybe they end up settling on what we call a local minimum where these are getting corresponded with these points here and you just never get anything better than this and it just sits there and finishes. The other, for example, if this was upside down and they're back to front, it might kind of do this and it's kind of pretty close, but it's not going to be able to completely flip it around necessarily and, and solve that problem, right? So there's a lot more to iterative closest point if you read the literature on it because there's lots of other strategies you could use. So for example, imagine that this is only a very small point cloud because we, again, we've captured some extra scan and it represents some small part of some object. And this is a huge point cloud that we've been reconstructing over many iterations. What we might want to do is ignore most of these points that are too far away, you know. So if we start over here and there's a bunch of stuff here, maybe we want to ignore it because it's too far away from where we're aiming for and, and try and pull it in the right direction. Right? Um, there are other ways you can calculate correspondences, but basically all of these approaches are aiming to shorten the number of steps it took to solve this problem. I mean, if, if I go back, actually use my lines, how clever. Um, right. So this was where I was originally, right? Um, and it was what? It was about one, two, so that's one, you know, two, three. It was about four or five iterations, bearing in mind that there's nothing accurate about what I just did. But about four or five iterations got us from over here to here, right? which is pretty nice. That's going to be much, much quicker than trying to do some kind of massive brute force search of all pairs of points from here to here, which is going to be, you know, n squared. It's going to be huge. Um, and this is not a normal number of points returned by a LiDAR scanner. Hund you know, thousands, multiple times a second, you know, at 60 hertz or something like this, right? We we we're talking a lot of points. So most of the research on this is about trying to, first of all, find iterative closest point approaches that solve even when your initial estimate is rubbish, right? Um, and also converge very, very quickly. So in this case, I came up with an initial estimate of here. You know, if I just got given this over here, I can't, I, this, is, this is less likely to work. So it, I needed to find something that was sufficiently close. So you need kind of almost like a head start because if that was up here near all those points we've ignored, then you've got no chance of it. Yeah, that's right. And, and actually what happens in practice, you might imagine, is you, you manually start this process. So you say, I mean, not for automatic LiDAR, but suppose you're stitching meshes for 3D reconstruction. You might say, well, I've got these, I think it's about there, and that, that will converge extremely quickly. You know? And one way you can do this is where we have actual corresponding points. So we could say this is point A, and this is also point A, and this is point B, and this is point B. And just for a few points, you can immediately get some kind of initial transformation, which can then be you know, adjusted. Right, assuming maybe I clicked on slightly the wrong point or something like that. How do you work out what the best kind of translation and rotation is? Well, without correspondences between these points, that's very, very difficult, which is, I guess, the whole point of the algorithm. Once you know that, let's say, this point goes with this one and this one goes with this one and so on, then actually it's, it's pretty simple matrix, matrix maths. So first of all, you can just calculate the difference between the centers and translate them like that. That's, that's fairly straightforward. And then you can do what we call singular value decomposition, which is basically a way of working out in one step what the optimal rotation would be that will minimize these distances. So this is a, this is you know a known mathematical process. 
it takes a little bit of time the more the more points you have so if you had millions of points against millions of points you wouldn't do that you would subsample some of the points and do smaller amounts of overlap in fact we can demo this now and i can show you this process all right so we'll get the laptop out and we'll have a look now i've downloaded something called the stanford bunny are you familiar with this the Stanford Bunny, no. Well, you've probably never heard, it's probably the most famous 3D model you, know, you might not have heard of, but it's, 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 a, it's a bunny rabbit, a ceramic bunny rabbit that was scanned, I think in the 90s or early 2000s. I can't remember, I should know exactly when it was scanned. Very, very commonly used in computer vision to... Um, to testing. To test reconstruction, stitching, you know, up shading. Anything graphical, you can use the Stanford Bunny as a kind of baseline mesh model. There's a number of these from this repository, the bunny is perhaps the most common. All right, so I've installed MeshLab. Now you have to forgive me because it's been some years since I've used MeshLab. It's coming back to me slowly, but I mean, there's buttons in different places and <laughs> things since last time. So I've downloaded the bunny and I've cleaned it up a bit because this, this bunny was actually computed by a laser scanner. And the thing that laser scanners produce, just like in our last video, is a depth map. It's a very accurate depth map, but you can't see behind things. So what you've got is a lot of halves and bits of bunny that just don't fit over each other at all. So if, for example, if I load all these in, you can see that what we've got is just an absolute mess of, of bunny all facing in different directions and it's not quite clear what we do. <laughs> so the first thing to do perhaps is hide some of these meshes so we can see a little bit better. I'm gonna zoom in. I've got this mouse, which should, if I press this button, magically connect to this laptop. It's much easier to use with a mouse. So I'll hide some of these and well, let's just look at two of these meshes. Okay, so we've got two messages, which we've got two meshes, which is a hard word to say lots of times quickly. Um, and they kind of align. You can see there's this side of bunny rabbit head here, side of bunny rabbit head. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to stitch these using iterative closest point. So I'm going to press the align button. I'm making, you know, to be fair, not that much effort. Right? Someone actually already stitched the bunny, which is the, the model that everyone actually uses. I'm only looking at these two. You can see them in different colors. And what the first thing I'm going to do is do that key point localization just to say it's roughly here. Right? And it won't be brilliant, but it will be okay. So. I'm going to go in, I'm going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to pick this first bunny as our reference. That's the one that's going to be static. And then the other one is going to move towards it, or at least that's the hope. So uh, I'm going to glue that mesh here, and a little star means that it's fixed. Now the next one, I'm going to select this one, and I'm going to say point-based gluing. And now I've got a new window up, which shows both meshes, and I can kind of click on, so I can double click on this eye here, and that eye here, and maybe the top of the ear and maybe the top of that ear and that's roughly the same place i mean i don't need to be super accurate it's not quite clear how i do the front of this face so i'm just going to sort of click there that's about right and then maybe a bit of tail uh, i mean i'm literally making this up as i go along you need about four points and then you can quite easily calculate the rotation and translation matrix that will get you a little bit of a way towards this uh, so let's have a go Right, that is not actually that bad. You can see that it's not, if I zoom in, you can see it's not really aligned, right? There's a, there's a few bits missing and the ears are a little bit off. Well, actually, I'm quite pleased with that. This ear is a bit off. Anyway, what we can now do is we can use iterative closest point to very quickly just go and just, just, just tidy that last bit up, which is of course what you would wanna do if you were putting this into any kind of um, serious graphics or anything like this. So all I need to do is press process. Now this automatically runs until some minimum error is reached. I'm gonna change it to maximum iterations of one, just so we can see it happening, rather than it just going, ta-da. So it's like step through it sort of thing. That's right, so I'm gonna click process and it's just gonna run one iteration where it corresponds points to the nearest points, moves them a little bit, and then stops, right? Um, and what we'll do is we'll just click that, and, and it did something, right? You might have to zoom in, <laughs> zoom in to see what it did. You can see there's a little gap here. I'm gonna click process a few times, and it's sort of moving in the right direction. And you can see it doesn't go back quickly because this correspondence problem, there's a lot of points here. It's a bit noisy, but it's actually working pretty well. And I'd say that they're pretty well aligned now, um, at least good enough for this demonstration. Let's have a look at another one of these models. So if I, if I, this has now been fixed. So if I unhide this one, this is the other side of the bunny. I'm not sure I've got enough corresponding points between these two. So I might try, what about that one? Yeah, that's got some, some, some bunny head on it. It's all very scientific and exact what I'm doing here. So again, we'll just go back to uh, click on this, do some point place gluing. So um, I don't know, I mean, something, something about, I'm, I'm not sure these will align because um, there may not be enough points in common, but I think probably. So they, yeah, okay, actually, well, there we go, so that's about four points. I mean, it's not disastrous, is it? Actually, that's pretty good. 
Um, it's not quite aligned. You can see there's a bit of a gap uh, there. What's, what's the button to move? Oh, there we go, look. So there's, there's quite a big gap, actually. Is this close enough? We will see. I'm gonna click process a bit. Oh, actually, it worked pretty well. Oh, nice. Quite pleased with that. We don't need to use the Stanford Bunny anymore. We can use Mike's special reconstructed Stanford Bunny, which will be superior. Uh, right, you can see there's some, actually there's some artifacts here from the laser scanning which would need to be removed because what you want to do is of each of the views of your bunny, you want to select only the very best bits of the mesh where it was looking straight on and then discard all the edgy bits that are not so good. And then overall you get a really, really you know, solid model. Right. So that's that's pretty much iterative closest point. You can actually, I mean, in, in Meshub, you can do all these at the same time and just, just optimize the whole thing, uh, you know. But it's it's a very effective algorithm and it's very, very quick. Right? If I hadn't have had to click process every time because I did that myself, this would have happened in a fraction of a second. I know there's something like 50 or 60,000 points on each of these bits of bunny, right? So that's not a trivial, you know, comparison to make unless you're doing some smart stuff about it. So it's a really cool algorithm. Is MeshLab one of these amazing, really expensive tools? No, nope, it's totally free. I think it's open source and definitely have a play around. So you can download the Stanford Bunny. We'll put a link in the description. You can download MeshLab or Cloud Compare is another really good one. There's various others. And just click the align button and start playing around with bits of Bunny. Uh, and it's good, good fun for everyone. <laughs>